without further ado, let me press the little magic button. And we have uh, somebody who is a regular at the conference. I think it's Bert's there. I don't know, it will be from Helsinki. Yes. So uh, Richard Witt talking to us today about discourses of an 18th century medical controversy. Elizabeth Neal, Thomas and Tobias Smollett, and the advent of man midwifery, which links very nicely to the first paper. Yes, so, thank you. Okay. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so, yeah, um, so basically, uh, as the title suggests, uh, following on from Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth's talk, um, focusing maybe on a very, very spe some specific authors involved. Um, there's actually three people involved. I didn't put one in the title because I'm not really looking too closely at this text. But um, I'm looking at three authors here. Um, the top one is, is probably the most famous one, uh, William Smelly, a famous uh, um, Scottish, I mean, from um, Lanark originally, um, a surgeon, but he came down and set up a midwifery practice in London. Um, then we have Tobias Smollett, who also has a background in medicine. I don't, I don't, he's also Scottish, you know, um, a bit younger than, than Smelly, but um, did they, they were um, <clears throat> associates and uh, he did a work to, with him, uh, but he eventually turned his uh, interest mainly towards literature, uh, mainly known for picaresque satirical novels. But again, he originally was a medical uh, obst I mean, practicing in obstetrics. And then we have the midwife, Elizabeth Neal, who penned a midwifery treatise. Uh, William Smelly also did. But uh, before I get into the details, just an overview of where I'm going today. Uh, a little bit about the context of 18th century man midwifery. Again, the general scene has already been set by Elizabeth, but I'll say a little bit more about some particulars that are going on, saying a bit more about the, uh, the authors I'm interested in. Uh, how the, What I'm looking at today is happening in the emergent review culture that emerged mid-century, particular in the critical review, uh, but again, I'll get into that in a bit. Uh, part looking particularly at what I call satirical discourse, um, again, I'll say a little bit more of that as well, and then we'll look at some text passages to illustrate what, these points. Um, so what's going on in the 18th, uh, well, late 17th, well, actually the 17th and 18th century? Um, I mean, uh, at least as far as the Anglophone world is concerned, and probably most of the rest of the planet as well, pretty much up until this period, childbirth was a very woman-centered event. Um, not even really even considered a medical event to be, unless something really went wrong, which was quite rare. Um, <clears throat> so it was really, you know, female midwives um, accompanying women who were giving birth and then maybe some female associates along that. Um, I mean, some women were, I mean, men were often barred from the birthing chamber altogether, except again, if there was a medical emergency, then you might get a male surgeon involved. Um, what really one of the big changes that you know fostered all these you know we saw with Elizabeth and stuff all these men starting to write uh, uh, midwifery treatises was the advent of instruments which actually goes uh, particularly the forceps which actually goes back to the beginning of the 17th century with the Chamberlain family um, family of surgeons they developed the forceps um, that would ease extraction of a, of a child in, in certain cases where you know, it might not manually be possible. Uh, but they kind of sat on this for about 100 years and kept it a secret just within the, the Chamberlain family. Um, so it wasn't really until the late 17th, early 18th century um, that this was more known. And then people like Smelly actually improved on, on the model. You have other instruments starting to come out like the Vectus, which is the middle, and then the crochet down there. Um, there's a whole speaking. We're in London, very appropriate for this meeting because if you go to the Science Museum and you go to the Welcome Collection, there's a whole panel full of all these early birthing instruments you can look at. Um, so, um, um, so within that context, um, this is also um, conducive to surgeons or man midwives saying, you know, just in case they start selling themselves, well, just in case something goes wrong, wouldn't wouldn't it be good if we were there? As opposed, you know, as opposed to you know when there's really an emergency. Well, just in case there's an emergency. So slowly over time, some women particular um, start to say, well, maybe they'll commission a man midwife to see them through the pregnancy, as opposed to you know your standard female midwife, just in case. Um, 
this this is in the era of sensibility, so this is bringing up a lot of social issues of you know male access to female bodies, particularly when it's not the husband. Um, but again, this is the one area where that's slowly starting to be tolerated. Um, there's backlash against this. Um, I mean, particular female midwives, a lot of female midwives, you know, I mean, are professionally threatened by this. Um, but men are encroaching more, and these men midwives are encroaching more and more on, on the area. Um, and so, I mean, again, the, I, what I want to make clear, though, this is not a simple, oh, all the men are doing this, all the women are doing that, because not all, men, some men midwives were vehemently opposed to the use of instruments. Um, instruments are not, we're also tied with political affiliation, with religious affiliation. It's a really, and you know, some would want to work with midwives, some midwives would be happy with the additional, you know, um, anatomical training they could get from from studying with, with surgeons or men midwives. So it's a really complicated thing. But over time, I mean, as we see from Elizabeth's talk, this is when the medicalization of childbirth uh, comes into full swing. So by the end of the century, you get more technical language. Uh, you get more. It's, it's becoming a branch of medicine as opposed to just a non-medical uh, event. <clears throat> Within this context, again, William Smelly, um, is a uh, again started in Scotland, but London was a lot more lucrative for men midwifery than than Scotland was. So he made his way down to London. Uh, again, improved forceps. Wrote a big midwifery treatise in the uh, what it was over the from 1752 to the 60, uh, 15, uh, 1760s. Three volumes um, with uh, the help of Tobias Smollett, who uh, was his editor as well, and again, they worked together. Uh, and historian Lisa Cody goes to goes so far as to argue that Smollett might have even ghostwritten the treatise. So um, who knows? And then Elizabeth Neal is a, a practicing midwife, but her background is actually in France. She was trained at the Hotel Dieu in Paris, uh, but then again, she made her way up to London and uh, also had her own midwifery uh, practice as well. Um, she was very vehemently opposed to um, to the use of instruments, but also to men midwives in general. She believed, I mean, in some ways she had a very essentialist view of, of the situation in that, you know, women qua women were the only qualified ones to do that. Even, even as far as, even if you take instruments out of the picture, the man's touch is not as delicate as the woman's touch in those kinds of things. Uh, so she penned a midwifery treatise in a, a sixth, uh, 1760. Um, the treatise on the art of midwifery uh, which was very, again, very much an, invec an invective against man midwives and particularly against the use of instruments, which she believed were causing more harm than good because all sorts of gory stories of an intervention happening. And then there's some very gory moments in that book. But anyway, not to get into that. So Tobias Smollett, um, being the, well, I'd say part of the literature th um, thing, he also, uh, from besides from moving from maybe medicine into literature, also taking on the area of literature. Uh, you have this emergent review culture uh, coming up in the uh, 1750s, started by the monthly review. I mean, Elena Semino briefly referred to that. Um, that was the first review periodical. This is where the genre of the book review is kind of starting. Uh, that was by Ralph Griffiths. It started in the, again, 1750s. Shortly after that, Tobias Smollett came out, he edited, was the editor, he came out with the critical review. Again, again, oh, and this wasn't just literature books, these were medical texts, any sort of academic text. Again, um, what we call modern book reviews. Um, the tone of the reviews wouldn't necessarily be how it was today. Again, positive reviews were glowingly positive. Negative reviews, the language could be, as we're going to see, quite, uh, yeah, not how you would write a book review nowadays. Um, and when the critical review came out, one of the first in one of the first, if not in the first edition, but in one of the first editions, Smelly's text was reviewed glowingly positive. Surprise, surprise. Um, again, um, supposedly objective reviews, but again, Smollett, I mean, Smollett had a very personal stake in Smelly's text as well. Um, Elizabeth Tre uh, Neal's treatise was also reviewed after it came out in this, and that was quite a different tone than Smelly's review. Um, and again, Smollett being also a satirical author was not beyond using satire when um, satirical language, when it suited him. 
And I think as a mode, I mean, this is 18th century satire, but I do think as a style from a stylistic framework, I think Paul Simpson's model of satire and the way he classifies this is very applicable, even though again, it's more contemporary, but we can apply it to the past. It actually satire operates at the level of ideology. So it's more at the discursive level. It's not pegged to any particular genre. So you can have satirical plays, you can have satirical novels, you can have satirical. It's, it's a mode of discourse. So I think this also can tie with critical discourse analysis, but we don't really have time to get into that today. But again, well, what, what exactly is satire? I think um, smut is Paul Simpson's way of, of doing it again. Um, it's not a foolproof model, but again, I think it's very uh, suitable for, for what I'm trying to do today. You know, we have the setting. So again, what is the cultural socio-historical context? Again, this is the advent of man midwifery. The methods, so then the stylistic linguistic realizations, um, grotesque caricatures. We have um, exaggerations of you know, descriptions against the object of attack, inversion of scripts and schemata, positive and negative polarities. Um, possible and impossible discourse worlds, we're going to get all of that. Um, uptake, again, the adversary being able to understand that. And the target, particularly today, is a combination of the personal, again, against Elizabeth Neal herself, and her textual product. Um, so, without further ado, we can look at his general tone. So this is the, uh, in the, the, the March 1760 issue of the Critical Review. We have a review of uh, Elizabeth Neal's um, treatise, which, by the way, his Tobias Smollett's name is not actually on the review itself in the text, but there's pretty much scholarly consensus that he's the one who did it, simply while he's the editor of the Critical Review and also um, basically also it, you would be forgiven when you're reading it that it's that you would think Elizabeth, uh, Sm uh, Elizabeth Neal, I'm getting these people in. <laughs> You would think that Elizabeth Neal was only attacking William Smelly. And if you actually read her text, yes, she does come down on Smelly, but she comes down on a lot of French authors as well. She actually even agrees with some of them. Um, but the tone of his review is pretty much a defense of Smelly almost all the way through. So it's almost like, again, it's, yes, yeah, very, again, you would get the impression that it's just about Smelly, but it's not. But anyway, Smollett's tone in his defense of Smelly um, basically, basically, if a pun may be allowed in discussing a ludicrous subject, um, in the next edition, this motto would suffice, ex nihilo nihil sit. Um, I don't know if this is applicable, but I mean, there is this historical association with uh, female genitalia being nothing, men's genitalia being something. Again, as we see, you know, you know Shakespeare's Much Ado About Nothing can also be interpreted as Much Ado About Mm. Um, so I don't know if, if this is also some double entendre pun against, you know, women. Um, but anyway, uh, you know, it's a dreadful noise. Again, very, very, um, again, oh, the poor, poor husband being uh, um, married to this woman. So again, quite a, a negative tone. Um, with respect to our author's ignorance, it might be detected in many articles, both of omission and commission. commission. Um, abuse, not instruction. The very basis of her performance is either a gross mistake arising from ignorance or a willful misrepresentation flowing from a worse motive. Um, okay, so, I mean, if we actually take a point that Smollett attacks, so now we're going to go to actually Neil's, Neil's treatise. Um, and this is one of her critiques of Smelly, but again, I just want to emphasize the treatise overall is not by any stretch of imagination just against William Smelly. Um, she's basically here talking about um, there's this really focus on, oh, yeah, well, women who have rickets, deformed pelvises, you know, yeah, you um, the argument Smelly and, and similar people to make was you really can only get a baby out through instrumental um, through instrumental assistance. And she said, and then her argument is, well, why doesn't he talk about you obliquity of the, the, the pelvis, which is sort of what is misaligned. It's not deformed, but it's maybe one hip is higher than the other. But that actually, she says, in her experience, that happens a lot more. Uh, but it seems they just don't want to talk about it because, again, in her experience, she is still able to have successful births without instruments uh, um, through manual skill. So again, thinking, OK, well, why are they not talking about this? And I have also delivered many rickety. Um, oh wait, so again, 
she uses that to say, well, you know, they're, they come in with their instruments, but then this is doing more harm than good. Um, so this particular passage comes under attack in Smollett's review. And then again, I don't have time, you know, I don't have space to like put the whole thing there. But again, just a sample of the kind of language she uses. Whoever denies this must be dead to common sense. Whoever understands midwifery in any tolerable degree must know that in some cases the concurrence of a very narrow pelvis in the other. Again, this implication that, yeah, Elizabeth Neal is just totally ignorant. Um, and, you know, we should be glad to know what this learned matron would do. Many other examples might be specified um, that this woman does not speak candidly or is not acquainted with her business at all. Again, definitely charges of incompetency being leveled against her. She then responds to this particular passage. Oh, OK, because then what happens? This is another text. She after after um, Smollett publishes his review, she writes a, a, another track like a track that's a response. An answer to the author of the critical review. This is about a 40 page treatise that comes out. It's a little later that year. And then she sort of attacks. Um, she basically does all the counterpoints to all the attacks that Smollett level against her. Um, and she says. Um, you know, on the contrary, I've, del I've delivered, you know, he says, well, how can you not use instruments? He's like, well, I've delivered many rickety women and many outwardly distorted women, but never found that at least affected the bones of the pelvis. Um, and, and basically saying, well, if I am ignorant about anatomy, um, I, I defer to the surgeons, not the man midwives, those who are more knowledgeable about anatomy overall. So I, I would say it's it's fair to say she she gives a very, I think, reasoned response to all of Smollett's charges. Uh, that said, she is not beyond the use of satirical language herself. Um, but particularly, she she does this issue about touch. This is also another point back to her treatise um, that I, th I think to see how small it responds. So this is back to her treatise, not the response. She has known women who have been in pain. Um, mitigation of the complaints uh, by you know the use of the midwife's hand. And again, but then again. Um, rather than the delicate fist of a great horse dog, mother of a he midwife, However, softened his figure might be by his pocket nightgown being a flower calico or his cap of office tied with pink and silver ribbons, where, as I presume, he would scarce, against Dr. Smelly's express authority, go about a function of this nature in a full suit and a tie wig. So, again, she's not beyond the satirical himself, herself. Uh, but then, in this particular response, Smollett is not also beyond the use of ribaldry. How far Mrs. Neal's shrewd, supple, sensitive fingers may be qualified for the art of titillation, we shall not pretend to investigate. But those women who are pleased with this operation before the pains come on may certainly choose their own operator without affecting the art of midwifery. We cannot help thinking, however, that in this case, the male practitioner would not be the most disagreeable unless I, our author has talents that which way we cannot conceive. So, uh, um, yeah, I don't, yeah. Implicature, Gracian implicatures, I think, would be very uh, relevant here as well. Um, she then responds to this in her answer. <laughs> in which passage I own, I cannot well pronounce which is the great, the modesty or the delicacy of the compliment. Um, then she uses this as a launch pad to make another point about Dr. Smelly. Um, um, for her patient, never puts the fingers through, though the practice of it is recommended by Dr. Smelly, speaking of touch, in more parts, then one of his work, I mean, the practice of running the fingers up the fundament or the anus. So no two, two minute warning in the way you did it earlier because, two, yeah, anyway. Um, but how, uh, then she quotes a passage of uh, Smelly. Um, how can this enter a man's head? There's no benefit or purpose to this. Again, and again, her use of, you know, nothing but torture. So again, you know, the kind of, you know, what you call exaggerated, not exaggerated, but extreme, um, you know, end of, of you know, scale of, of very intense and, and um, uh, what do you call intensifying language is, is sure, certainly not here. And then I do not conceive that there can be imagined a more nauseous, ridiculous, cruel, absurd management. And if such are the triumphs of the men's learning over the women's ignorance, may the women continue in their ignorance all of such a curious practice. Um, OK, so that's her um, small uh, Smollett to get these people straight. He then responds to her response. In another, in the later issue of the Critical Review later that year, basically just a paragraph. Um, I can't again. I don't want to repeat the whole thing, but 
He basically just writes off her response saying, well, it was never our intention to enter the list with a lady, especially with a lady of your profession of whose skill in the weapons of altercation, we could not be ignorant. Uh, we cannot pretend to answer in less than as many volumes and that you have delivered yourself of a monstrous birth that fully evinces your dexterity in obstetric art. May it, however, be the last of our begetting. Heaven preserve us from the heinous crime of fornication. Um, so basically, but, uh, and this he actually in his original review, um, in several points, he's, you know, this is so ridiculous. I don't think we even have to address it. So basically his response to Neil's response is, this is so ridiculous. I don't think we even have to talk about it. So again, I would, I would say on one level, her response to his response, uh, his review is, you know, fairly reasoned. It's like, well, actually in my own practice, I've seen this in my own practice, I've seen that. Um, his response is, this is just so ridiculous. We're not even going to engage with it. So yeah, draw your own conclusions. Uh, I've drawn mine for sure. Um, I think where uh, we can, where does this uh, land us in the larger context? Is this really a controversy? Or is this basically just professional posturing on various levels? Again, depending on what's professionally at stake. I mean, Eve Keller, who's, who's written on uh, reproduction during this era, also has noted that even a lot of the treatises penned by men and women, it's, it's just as much about professional posturing as it is about any sort of didactic instruction. Um, so is there, I think, a little of both going on here? Um, I think it would be interesting to look at this in the larger, again, emergent review culture from the 1750s onwards um, to see how were other men with midwifery treatises received in the review culture. Um, I mean, I, you can, um, I have to look more. I mean, I know, I know others have been reviewed. Um, how is it the women versus the, again? There's not that many more treatises penned by women, but again, yeah, again, looking at how the others might have been received or other ways of of gauging text reception. On a final note, again, I think it's particularly relevant that we're here in London because while Smollett and Smelly enjoy posthumous monuments and maternity wards named after them, uh, there's nothing for Elizabeth Neal who ended up. Uh, in a workhouse, dying in a workhouse, and being buried in a pauper's grave. However, uh, near here, not too far from here, near Trafalgar Square, uh, we have the Edith Cavell Memorial, and also a medical woman, although she was a uh, nurse, British nurse for the armed forces during World War I, who ended up being executed by the Germans, um, and a memorial was erected to her again near Trafalgar Square. However, beneath, this is the site of the pauper's grave that Elizabeth Neal was buried in. So if you do want to pay your respects to Elizabeth Neal, you can go to the Edith Cavell Memorial. OK, thank you. Right next to it, of course, the National Portrait Gallery, where many of the portraits I think we've seen today probably have. Ah, right, any questions? That's quite the debate that they have. Uh, <laughs> well, bordered on the obscene. Uh, yeah, yes. Yeah, well, it was, and certainly the social practices suggest it were quite remarkable to the modern mind. Indeed, two obstetrics. <laughs> that is a particular issue. In terms of the results that you have, then, are these results which you think are really quite specific to this interaction, or do you think that within <laughs> medical debate, say in the 18th century? Uh, satire, riddlery, etc., mm. do have a role to play. By the look of it, as people are jockeying for professional position. Yes, um, I would say. I mean, within the review culture, I mean that to taking that kind of tone in the review would not be exclusive to just against Elizabeth Neal. Again, people like Smollett, where there would have been a negative review, it would have been in these kind of blistering tones. So, I mean, that that kind of language is not exclusive. I mean, we could see even Elizabeth Neal was not beyond that herself. Um, I mean, in most of the other midwifery treatises that I've looked at in detail are pretty much, okay, again, here's the technical art. I mean, I think as Elizabeth was showing, it's all about technical descriptions and all. Um, I, I think you'd have to really look more. I mean, I think in the treatises themselves, um, I think Elizabeth Neal's treatise for the century is quite um, exceptional because most of it isn't about, let's look at the technical specifications of midwifery. Most of it is arguing, you know, actually, this advent of instruments, instruments aren't a good thing, men, men midwives aren't a good thing. Most of midwifery treatises are more technically oriented. It's a, you know, this is birth, this is the afterbirth, this is what you can do, the use of instruments or not, you know, like 
other others were very anti-instrumentalist. So, um, so her 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 midwifery treatise itself was a bit exceptional in terms of its its topical coverage. Um, I, I do think we have to look. Um, I mean, I don't think within the midwifery treatises themselves. Hmm, I think we'd have to look more broadly. Be interesting too. The other thing that occurred to me, thinking back to something I said to him this morning, is whether you're seeing uh, within the um, argumentation right. uh, a reflection of broader trends in society at the time yeah. in learning circles. So when I think of the 18th century, you know, satire usually comes to mind. Yeah, like, yeah. Rupert Addison, Swift, Swift, like that. Swift, yeah. And certainly when it comes to ribaldry and satire, I think of Swift. Yeah. So do you think that you're seeing a sort of broader influence from uh, literary styles coming into the argumentation strategy? I, I definitely, they're arguing a bit like Pope or they're arguing a bit I mean, yeah, like when, when I first when I first read Smollett's um, review, I thought this is quite literary. Mm -hmm. um, so I do. I definitely do think that is coming in here. And that's not a common feature you would get in the midwifery treatises themselves. Yeah. Again, within Midwit uh, Mid Neil's original treatise again. She does have some blistering attacks, but I think she starts to pick up on that satirical tone in her response. So I think Smollett has adopted it. She's going to try to use it back at him. Mm -hmm. um, in her original text, again, she can have blistering attacks, but she doesn't really go into that satirical mode. She starts to adopt it herself in her response to Smollett. So I, there is probably definitely a literary, and again, coming in from the review culture, which was done by mainly men of, of le, the men of letters and literature, there is probably an influence of the literary style coming into this. Yes, yeah. and, and in talking about that, see about the general response to the general uh, changes that are coming and uh, how they, they fit in with that. But talking about the jockey, how much of that is about their personal practices and is there any background about what their clientele might have been in which they're, they're dealing with? Are, are, are people like Smollett actually, uh, I've got a very wealthy clientele and I'm protecting my position? Oh, no, absolutely. I mean, um, I mean, I think at that point, Smollett really isn't practicing anymore. Um, Smelly is, but I mean, in terms of the jockeying of position, I mean, Keller wrote a little about that. I mean, even going back to like um, noting that the, the tone of like Sarah Stone's treatise wasn't really much different than maybe some of the, the male authored treatises. I, I, I think it does tie in with their, their personal practices. Again, were they anti-instrumentalist? Were they pro-instrumentalist? Um, and again, it's it's not always it's these kinds of things like I, I want to know about them, but it's from the treatises themselves. That's not always easy to gauge. Uh, I think uh, what Elisabetta mentioned, the, 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 the paratexts and the prefatory materials are really valuable um, parts of the text because the main text themselves might just be technical. OK, this is what happens with the afterbirth. But um, I think in the prefatory material, in the paratext, that's where I think you can start to get a little bit more of this larger context as well. well we have two questions, I think. One of the Frank and then one here. So, Tim. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I think that this controversy is quite quite sort of rare because we know the names, names of the parties here. I have come across some some other controversies where they, the, they are anonymous and we don't know who wrote them, but the language is extremely insulting. Yeah. And here, so it was, was a train, but, yeah. but here it's explicit what it is that who are right. their, 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 yeah. their each other. Often also religion is, yes. is involved in this. And, and the publication is interesting too. To one of the conflicts that I know, know is in the Gentleman's magazine, and it's all anonymous. And, and people at the time knew who they were, but right. we have no way of no, knowing no. that. Well, I mean, Elizabeth Neal is of a Catholic background and, you know, uh, Smelly being from Lanarkshire is, you know, Scottish Presbyterian. I, again, I don't know how much that factors into it, but I mean, you're absolutely right. Again, political affiliation and religious affiliation would factor into this. Can I just check in with, with those 18th century insulting texts that you're talking about? Yes. So that was maybe the sort of satire. Yes. Right? Yes. And we have a question here yes. also, I think. Um, I uh, one of you showed uh, a system. Yeah. And um, so the question of uh, how to moderate this is quite uh, 
<laughs> yeah, in debate, uh, right. still, and the, especially the, the connection to genre, the genre concepts. Right. Um, and uh, for historical linguistics, this is very difficult to nail down registers, I think. Right. Yeah. So, uh, how <laughs> this, uh, from, from my perspective, I don't know how your opinion is, this is a mismatch of registers in the genre. Um, but they can be different views on this. Um, the question is how would you, from a bottom up uh, perspective, Right. Um, well, I would say, I mean, within the book review culture that, I mean, the book review, I mean, the review culture becomes yeah. its own, it's, that's an emergent genre. And I mean, um, that's new at this point. And I mean, I think Irma was suggesting, I mean, when, if you had a glowing review, you had a glowing, but these negative reviews from very on were like, that was common of the genre. Yeah. I mean, so that was a common, I mean, I don't know if you'd say satirical, but I mean, there's really blistering <laughs> satire. I mean, Again, small it being, again, I'd have to look what, what it was like in the monthly review. I'm, I'm not, you know, with Ralph Griffiths, I'm not as uh, familiar with, with that, the kind of language that might have been used there. But negative review, again, now, if, you know, if you write a negative book review, it's like, you know, we're very uh, charitable, even, even to the lesser of, of good books. Um, but back then it was like, yeah, this, you know, these people don't know what they're talking yeah. about. So. And I mean, Hillary, yeah. Hillary thank yeah. you. Um, and uh, use of irony. So I think that was, this was an emerging genre. This was a very new genre at the time, but I mean, that was a, a distinction feature from very early on. And did you mention some specific Um, um, I mean, I would say definitely the, I mean, I'm trying to think, um, I'd say there'd be a lot, I don't know, like grammatical features. Again, I'd have to look at that more closely. I mean, a lot of a lot of use of implicatures, a lot of use of um, I mean, what he said, like extreme exaggeration, grotesque, like very extreme of the polarities, you know, so it would be very if something was good, it was like in very, you know, exaggerated language. If something was bad, it was in very negative language. Um, again, we could see the, the use of implicatures. Um, I think there's a lot of, what does I say, also tones of this is so ridiculous, we don't even have to talk about it. So not really even elaborating, like, oh, we don't even have to go there. This is, any any reader could figure out how ridiculous this is. Because we, I mean, we cannot understand this in, uh, in English, I think, but I'm basically working for all that German. Oh, okay. Yeah. That was very different. That would be very, and I, yeah. Okay, so I shall have to draw down the curtain as we're in a Cinderella context, where we have to leave them. It's as close to five o'clock as possible because there's another meeting in here this evening. Oh, so you'll not carry on talking scattered to the cafes and restaurants that are plenty of around here. Otherwise, see you again in the morning. But fine, thank you, Tariq.